Full Moon was built from the stories of small creatures creating mayhem. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are some very creative horror sci-fi films in this canon, and not just of the short variety. I want to do things a bit different. Let's look at a production company and a few films that are the building blocks of a unique empire. I'm talking about the underdog of shoestring genre films, Full Moon Entertainment. Full Moon was birthed in the late 80s out of the remnants of its original structure, Empire Pictures. Like Full Moon, Empire was a production house whose focus was on genre films with a small-scale, independent feel. The man behind this labor of love was Charles Band, a man so Californian, my Chicago ears can't help but become amused. And these awesome dudes. Really, really hard getting them to be. It's pretty awesome. It's gonna be out there. But with mounting debt, Empire Pictures went under, and Full Moon Entertainment was born. This was to be a straight-to-video venture that would embrace horror and sci-fi, but give it a more grandiose feel on an independent budget. If we could put it on a spectrum, Full Moon was the anti-trauma, and that's not an insult to the always fantastic Lloyd Kaufman. Trauma films are amazing, and I've always felt a friendly rivalry between the two companies, like that of Charles Xavier and Magneto. Charles. Trauma films are always delightfully cheesy, but it's Charles Band and his noble push for a type of genre quality in a straight-to-video era that has set him and Full Moon apart. Now these pillar films of Full Moon aren't deep cuts, like Bad Channels, Crash and Burn, or Seed People. All fun flicks that deserve a deeper look, but I want to discuss ones that Full Moon fans, like myself, consider required reading material. On a distant planet, we get a rugged cop whose destructive ways have put him on paid leave, with the mayor on his ass and a violent madman looking for revenge. We get a truly late 80s sci-fi cop story in 1991. The cop tracking has now escaped assailant, go through a wormhole, and end up on our very own planet Earth. But now in a faraway galaxy, we are a planet of giants, and our hero is now the size of a doll. His name is Brick Bardo, and he's played by Tim Thomerson. Urban fucking renewal. Two names so cool that when spoken together, they may just represent the unspeakable name of God. Tim Thomerson is essentially playing a mini version of his Jack Death character, but it suits him so well. Tim has perfected the dry-witted tough guy. We get some ambitious shots and blue screen effects that are pretty dated, but it sells the idea well enough. One truly old school idea is the plot point of his gun being unnecessarily powerful. On his planet, his gun has the power of a C4 explosive. No exit wounds just dead. They translate on our Earth as a Robocop type of bullet wound. On Earth, Brick has to deal with a Bay Area gang because the 90s. And they are led by the marvelous character actor Jackie Earl Haley, Rorschach himself. Brick has to go toe to toe and stop this gang from terrorizing the neighborhood. Jackie is a versatile actor who can give a lot when used right, not for a total of 10 minutes like they did in The Dark Tower. And maybe if Nicholas Arcel did a bit more research and tried to handle this beautiful, unique tale with more grace and honor, he wouldn't have slapped me and all the fans in the face with this incompetent interpretation. You've forgotten the face of your father, friend, while somehow, somehow miscasting Matthew McConaughey? One of the strongest franchises in the Full Moon catalog would be Subspecies, and its perfect take on the vampire. The story revolves around an American woman, Michelle, who is stalked by a vampire while living and studying in Romania. It's a simple premise that is very well developed in a classic vampire lore setting. These films came out before the 2000s boom, when vampires were cool, and far before they needed to be sexy. Except for you, Brad Pitt. Except for you. Subspecies 2 is one of the rare exceptions where the narrative and characters are expanded in a meaningful way while the stakes being set higher makes sense story-wise. In Subspecies 2, Radu is trying to capture Michelle, guide her into her new vampire life while reclaiming the Bloodstone, a mythical object that drips the blood of saints and has a drug-like effect on the vampire who feeds from it. This relic has been at the heart of a power struggle between Radu and his royal vampire family. The subspecies series works because of its dedication to its mythology while also being a straightforward horror film. From Radu, the Nosferatu-type vampire, 
the cool practical effects, and the interesting mythology set in actual Romania, Subspecies 2 and the series itself is a must for any fan of the vampire genre. The cover art for the VHS age was really sink or swim. What you got from the video store was completely dependent on it. To this day, Demonic Toys has one of the best box covers in horror. Set in a stocking warehouse for various toys, an undercover cop tries to deal with a gun trade gone bad, her dead partner slash lover, possessed toys, and the devil himself. The biggest sell here are the toys. From the mind of John Beekler, John did the effects for Reanimator, From Beyond, and directed my favorite Friday the 13th film, The New Blood. He created some unique ideas for the toys, even with the shoestring budget that comes with making a straight to VHS film. The toys look good and each have a distinct style. Again, for the time and small budget, I've seen far worse. Dude, Jack Attack and the Grizzly Teddy are both creepy by design and are pretty vicious. But baby Oopsie Daisy is the winner here. He's probably the best Chucky knockoff we've gotten. Fuck Mary Fuck. I'm dying. I can't even shit my pants. While the devil child himself is just naturally chilling, especially with the adult ADR. Fan blood's really gonna run. He was in Children of the Corn 3, so I'm not the only one. The story is pretty standard as it's survived the night in a single location. But with some intriguing camera work, creepy visuals, and a somewhat campy yet cohesive script by David Goyer? Weird. This early 90s killer toy film works. I would argue the Transfer series is Full Moon's most consistent and accessible franchise since Puppet Master. We get Tim Thomerson come into the character he was born to play, Jack Death. This man is blessed with the best character names. Jack Death is a police detective from the year 2247. It's a Blade Runner-esque future where he must hunt down trancers. These are brainwashed, sort of sleeper agents who can snap when ordered to. Trancers is Full Moon's attempt to do a Blade Runner type film for home video. They were smart enough to understand its small budget couldn't realize the story in a meaningful way, so they added time travel to solve its problem. This was smart and works in the film's favor. Jack Death can be a badass futuristic cop with a fish out of water humor to balance it out. Trancers 2 is the best of the series. The production is slicker. Having Jack Death and a young Helen Hunt living life in the 90s, kind of like Doc Brown settling down in the 1800s, works perfectly for advancing the story. Whistler, the villain from the original, has a brother who's come from the future, or down the line. 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 Down the line now, Jack. To start a trancer militant group, he will build an army out of the homeless and mentally ill and take over the world. Sold. I mean, do I need to go on? Action, humor, and a commanding lead make this sequel superior to the first, and Tim Thomerson sells the entire thing. I was even him for Halloween once. Yeah, costume design isn't my strong suit. Jack Death is an old school pulp detective who doesn't give a damn. His slick back hair, long trench coat, and constant smoking is everything it needs to be. To me, Tim is Charles Band's muse. Scorsese has DiCaprio, Tarantino has Uma, and Charles Band has Tim f***ing Thomerson. Full Moon Entertainment was at the forefront of the exclusive home video market. Charles Band put together a production company worth the time of genuine genre fans. 27 years strong, Charles Band is an independent film American hero. With entries like Ginger Dead Man and Evil Bong, Band is steering the new era of Full Moon into fully embracing its camp. I salute his ability to adjust and stay afloat in an ever-changing business. I have grown up with these films. But now, I have passed them on to you. Have I got your attention now? Go and do likewise, gents. All of Full Moon films are out there. You take the ride, it's yours. You don't, you'll be missing something special. If, we, if we're ever gone one day, which will never happen, knock on no wood here, but then all that will be left will be, and not saying that they're doing a bad job, Netflix, Hulu, those sites, Amazon. And the problem is that the coolest, most clever movies that I think have been made over the last 40 years that we all fell in love with as kids would never have been made through a major network or a major cable network. These are oddball, weird movies that a filmmaker goes, you know, I, I can scrape this thing together and I can make a Halloween or I can make a, whatever the movies are, I can make these clever movies. Once that goes away and those independents are no longer making movies, it'll be a bummer because then it'll just be, you know, the six or seven big streaming sites. And 
that's not going to get these kind of movies made.